Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. As a big book study, the goal of this recording is to increase our collective knowledge of the book Alcoholics Anonymous by sharing with each other. Let's start by having our presenters introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm Callie. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Kelly. Um, So today, Callie and I are presenting on chapter two in the big book, There is a Solution. And... um, This is, it comes directly after um, the first chapter, which is Bill's story, where we hear about his journey um, and how AA came to be and um, this design for living. And we get into chapter two, which starts on page 17 in the big book. And this design for living starts to get spelled out for us. So that's where we are in the journey of the book right now. As I read through this, um, a key theme in this chapter um, is why. (laughs) It starts out with a lot of kind of the searching for why. And I want to say that in my experience, I sought out the why for a long time. And maybe you can relate to that, maybe not, but the why was really important to me um, early in my journey. Um, And I found, though, that knowing some of the why did not help me. (laughs) So the first part of this is really looking into the why, but it's not necessarily going to help us or help. It doesn't didn't help me in the solution. It just better described my problem to me. So that's the first thing I notice in this chapter on the solution. Um, I hope you can see some similarities today in your own fake news search for the why. Um, For me, that was um, where I I stayed for a long time and it kept me pretty sick um, because I thought that knowing the why would be the solution. But we learn in this book as we go through this chapter further that the why is not the solution. Um, you know, I ultimately can't know why. And even if I do know why, I'm really sitting in the problem, not in the solution. So <laughs> this is like, you know, when I read read something like there is a solution, I used to be an A plus student. I don't know how many of you um, listening to this are, um, you know, overachievers like me. Um, but I loved acing a test, right? Like, give me a, a study sheet, I'm going to ace this. Um, But when I found out at the end of this chapter and in the uh, appendix on the spiritual experience that the way to ace this test is through willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness, holy, you know, how are you going to ace a test on willingness, (laughs) open-mindedness, and honesty? So obviously this solution was going to be different than other solutions I've I've, um, worked on in the past. So um, I just wanted to bring this up as we start. We're going to learn about the why doesn't matter in this chapter. We're going to learn that what we have in common may initially seem to be the problem, but really what we have in common in this meeting today and to our friends listening is what we have in common is the solution, not just the problem. There's lots of people out there who are alcoholics who are not in the solution. So this is really what we have in common. We're going to learn how our disease tricks us. We're going to learn that self-knowledge and self-control aren't going to really solve things for us, Um, but that accepting our powerlessness, learning to surrender, and being open-minded about having a relationship with a higher power. This is where our solution really lies, and the way to guard, and this is also the way that we can guard against the insanity that leads to that first drink. So that's all just an intro to chapter two. And if you want to follow along, I'll start here on page 17 in the big book. Um, So this chapter is really a blessing. We get an understanding um, of what worked for Bill and how AA started. And now they're going to show, they who, who started this are going to show us how. So we learn the solution here. And um, we learn also that this is, 
um, about how people have recovered and have solved the drink, drink problem. So these are past tense um, verbs. So we can understand that this actually works. Um, another thing that stands out to me is the chapter starts with the word we. And so I learned that I don't have to do this alone. And I love how one of our members shared that in the last 10 years, she's never had to have a day alone. And that's really true. This is a we program. And that's a real relief to me. Um, when I saw and learned about the we in this program, um, it, it, uh, it helped me know that I wasn't by myself. And on this page here, we learned that um, it doesn't matter who we are, how far, how far down the path we've gone. We share a sisterhood and alcohol may be our common denominator, but regardless of our status, our religion, our education, we have a common peril. And that common peril is the drink problem. Um, and it's not enough to keep us in sisterhood. So again, the problem isn't what keeps us in sisterhood. It's um, the common solution that keeps us in sisterhood. So when I look back on my life and think about alcohol being a common denominator in many of my relationships, I can viscer viscerally recall working with a man who was training for a marathon, and he had the audacity to come out to a work happy hour and drink orange juice. <laughs> what? Who comes to a work happy hour and flipping drinks orange juice, right? Well, you might guess that what happened. And um, no, I didn't sleep with him because this was early in my drinking career. So I wasn't that far advanced, but I did try strongly to persuade him to drink. Um, who cares about that marathon training that you're working toward, right? Like you're at a work happy hour. Um, so he didn't drink. And so I decided that he couldn't be a friend of mine. And just simply like that, I closed the circle in my life more and more and more. And I've had many potential relationships go this way. And funny enough, people didn't seem to stick around me. It took me a long time to see that alcohol as the common denominator was a key factor in the sadness, loneliness, and confusion I felt in my own life. And so again, I'm relieved that there's a solution, that this is a we program, and that it's through our common solution that we're bound together in this sisterhood. Uh, when we look at page 18, we learn more about how this solution initially works. And personally, I didn't realize how sick I was I, until I came into the program. I thought I had a drinking problem, but didn't think I was an alcoholic. Um, I had a similar experience as described on, on page 18, but the ex-problem drinker who has found the solution, who's properly armed with facts about herself, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. Now, what this means to me is how AA works is I get to be in sisterhood with other women. I get to be of service to other women. And um, that the way that I can accomplish the solution is by being with other alcoholics who are in the solution. So for many years, my disease told me I was fine, that I just needed more willpower, that I needed to switch up how I drank, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure you can relate. But I couldn't always clearly match the consequences um, in my life to my actions. And it was by working with other women, my dear sponsors who are on the call here today, um, and the sisterhood who so kindly showed me the way that I was actually able to see my disease. And though I came here to solve a problem, I gained a new life I never imagined in this solution. So I'm gonna pass over to Callie and she's gonna start um, chatting with us about content starting on page 19, if you wanna read along. Hey guys, thank you so much for this opportunity. I and Kate, thank you so much for starting us off. I, I haven't been to as many meetings in the last two weeks because of just family and holidays and uh, this commitment has kept me grounded and it's so it's just so good to see you all i just i love this meeting so thank you i'm going to start at the top of page 19. Uh, the first full paragraph bill writes we feel that elimination of our drinking is but a beginning 
And um, to me, this is, I love this line. It's one of the most important lines in the book. Um, and my sponsor, sponsor, Amy, she always says, you know, that if, if, if drinking, stopping drinking were the solution, then we would just sit at meetings and point at each other and say, don't drink, just don't do it. Um, and that's obviously not the case. So in the next paragraph, um, he writes, those of us who live in large cities are overcome by the reflection that close by hundreds are dropping into oblivion every day. Many could recover if they had the opportunity we have enjoyed. How then shall we present that which has been so freely given us? And um, that statement about uh, people around us suffering has always sort of struck me. Um, in other words, you know, it's not just me, it's not just us, there are other people out there. Um, yeah, I, whenever I read that, I'm just sort of humbled a little bit. And um, the answer to the question that he poses at the end of the paragraph, how then shall we present that which has been so freely given us? Um, that's really what we're looking for in the solution because that's a huge part of the solution is giving away what we have. Um, sometimes it's my entire solution. So um, through the next few pages, we learn how to become conscientious individuals in the program and in our lives. And I'm just going to read this whole paragraph starting at the bottom here. Of necessity, there will have to be discussion of matters medical, psychiatric, social, and religious. We are aware that these matters are, from their very nature, controversial. Nothing would please us so much as to write a book which would contain no basis for contention or argument. We shall do our utmost to achieve that ideal. Many of us sense that real tolerance of other people's shortcomings and viewpoints and a respect for their opinions are attitudes which make us more useful to others. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. Um, it's basically the way I interpret this is, um, yeah, we're gonna talk about religion and medicine and culture and all that stuff, but none of that ultimately matters if we're able to set ourselves aside and put the needs of others first. Um, again, presenting that which has been so freely given us. And I was trying to figure out a way to, also I'm like really out of breath talking. Um, <laughs> one time I wore my heart rate monitor watch while I was presenting and I looked at it afterward. I didn't even realize I had it on, but my heart rate was just spiking. It's funny because I'm not normally you know, a shy person, but also I'm pregnant and always out of breath. So bear with me on that. But um, thinking about how to be selfless. Um, it was hard for me to figure out a way to describe that um, and how that mentality helps me today because I'm pretty inherently selfish. Um, but I think personally, a part of putting someone else's needs first is not assuming um, what they need or want, you know, actually listening to them. Um, and as the mother of a toddler, that's really difficult because to an extent, I have to assume what my daughter's needs are. Uh, but more and more, you know, she's able to communicate with me. And if I give her the opportunity, she's able to communicate with me and we can have that healthy relationship. So that's a good area for me to practice in my life. Um, at the top of page 20, we start to get into the question of what makes an alcoholic an alcoholic. Uh, but the more important question, I think, comes next. Mm, that kind of goes back to what Kate is saying, you know, the why. Um, but the next question is at the end of the next full paragraph, which is what do I have to do to recover? And the simplified answer is to do what others who have recovered have done and to conti continue to do. Um, and I know this works because, you know, I've got a sponsor that that shows me that that's how it works. If I have a problem or an, something I'm experiencing uh, and I share it with her, she says, you know, I, either, yes, I've experienced that or I haven't. And let me talk to my sponsor. Or let me talk to other women and, and we'll get to the bottom of, of someone else's experience. So, um the paragraph that describes how non-alcoholics are baffled by an alcoholic's continued drinking uh, in the face of mounting consequences, it's just another opportunity for me to practice tolerance. Um, the book says, we see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. And uh, that's just a reminder to me, you know, just because someone else's reactions um, to, a, so, to the same situation are different doesn't mean I get to judge them. And uh, then, you know, we get into the moderate drinker and the hard drinker. And I used to see myself in the hard drinker. I never saw myself in the moderate drinker, like he was saying. I never really understood that. But um, now, 
it's clear to me that I was never even a hard drinker um, because none of the sufficiently strong reasons listed here or any other were enough to make you slow down. Um, and now Kate is going to tell us more about the real alcoholic. Thank you, Callie, and congratulations. <laughs> Okay, the real alcoholic, the real McCoy here. So um, on page 21, basically, um, the rest of this page and into the next talks about who is this real alcoholic, and we get the definition of an alcoholic here um, at the in this uh, first full paragraph that starts, but what about the real alcoholic? The definition is... Um, he begins to, um, you know, lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. So that um, could be a definition and works, works pretty well for me. Um, basically, the first drink gets me drunk. And uh, the rest of this page describes um, an alcoholic. And I'm just going to list off a few of the descriptions and maybe, you know, mentally tick off the list where, where you might find some similarity in um, past problems. Um, starts moderate, at some stage loses control, does absurd, incredibly tragic things while drinking, seldomly, mildly intoxicated, more or less insanely drunk, disposition while drinking does not resemble her normal behavior, can be a fantastic woman, but when give it, you give her a drink, she becomes disgustingly and dangerously antisocial. She's a genius at getting drunk at the wrong time. She's pretty sensible and well-balanced, except when it comes to liquor, and here she's dishonest and selfish. She has special skills and abilities, and she probably has a good career, and she pulls the roof down on top of her head via a series of sprees, and she goes to bed so drunk she should recover for a day or two, but wakes up to madly drink more and so on. For me, um, I can relate a lot to these descriptions and I've, I, I starred the ones that work for me and, you know, su surprisingly, non-surprisingly, actually all those descriptions <laughs> describe me as a problem drinker. Surprise, surprise, right? Um, there's a story, I was about 16 years old, and I was teaching Sunday school um, to third graders, and I think it was third graders anyway. It was one of the years that doesn't really matter in the Catholic Church because they've already done communion, and it's not close enough to confirmation, so they allowed someone like me as a 16-year-old to teach the Sunday school. And um, I was out with all the nuns and some of the other Sunday school teachers for a celebration, um, and I had, I was 16, I had this internal conflict, right? As a problem drinker, I knew I wanted to be, do right by the kids in my care. I wanted to do right by the nuns and by my religion I had grown up in. Yet I showed up to the celebration lunch that we were having together extremely hungover because at 16, I had been out at a bar until three in the morning the night before. Um, and so this, for me, is a great example to me of how this disease took over my life. And even though my basic instincts, you know, the next day when slightly less inebriated showed me I didn't want to be behaving this way, I still did it. I couldn't stop. And so my own nature when drunk versus when sober varied greatly, even at the age of 16. And um, P.S. I hope all those third graders are okay. <laughs> so I want to direct us back into the book on page 22. Um, we get into the middle of the page. Um, you know, why, why does she behave like this? Why does the alcoholic do this kind of crap, right? If we know that drinking destroys us and humiliates us, why? <laughs> we're told that we may never know the full answer. My sponsor once shared with me the thought that resonated, resonated with me. She said, maybe because of the Big Bang, right? Sure, <laughs> because we exist with the Big Bang. That's why, okay, that can be an answer. Or maybe for me, it was because I didn't know how to manage my own discomfort. 
discomfort and who I was as a 16 year old discomfort is who I was when I was a 40 year old discomfort with who I am today, even right. And so um, we know we do know that at a certain point, the little can be done for an alcoholic um, until we can start working on a solution. So in this book, if we're on the bottom of page 22, we're told that we cannot take one drink into our system or it will become impossible to stop. Essentially, what we're told here is that our mental insanity is what leads to the first drink and sets up the phenomenon of physical craving. So it's not necessarily the first drink will get me drunk, but it's the insanity in my brain that tells me those consequences aren't going to happen this time. That humiliation is not going to happen this time. It's that lie that my disease creates this fake news story, right? That's what sets it up for that first drink. And then once we have that, that physical craving, um, it takes over. And all of this, like Kelly said a moment ago, it wouldn't matter if just not drinking was the solution, right? Um, but if we don't take that first, you know, the, the common, the, the thing we have in common is what enters into our minds, not into our bodies. So again, the solution is, um, how we can um, help ourselves think um, differently. And we have, uh, we're told on the middle of page 23, um, and I'm going to pass to Callie in just a minute, but I, on the middle of, of uh, page 23, we're told that the main problem of the alcoholic centers in our mind, not in her body, and that um, the alcoholic will have a lot of fallacious reasoning um, as to why we took that first drink. And so I just wanted to define um, fallacious for you because I thought this was helpful. Um, tending to deceive or mislead, fallacious reasoning as to why I took a drink could also mean faulty reasoning, fake news. <laughs> it could also mean something that may try to appear better than it really is. And that is fallacious, the fallacious reasoning that we may come to that may seem reasonable, but it's the insanity that leads to that drink. And I'll, I'll pass to Callie. Thank you, Kate. Um, also, I forgot to congratulate Katie and Rebecca. You guys are inspirational. Uh, I love you so much and I'm so happy. Yes, it's just wonderful. So anyway, um, so before we understand that there's a solution, uh, it's helpful, at least for me, to thoroughly understand the problem when I'm looking at, if someone just says, here's the solution, you know, I I don't care um, if I don't understand, you know, if there's not relatable experiences um, included, then I wouldn't care about the solution. You know, as a selfish person, it's usually only when I read or hear something that relates to me personally that I start to pay attention. So, um, you know, you can talk all about other people's horrible experiences and what's happened to them. And um, if it doesn't relate to me personally, you know, I'm not likely to, to, to take note. So for me, when I came to this program, um, you know, 12 and a half years ago, it was a lot of stuff in the big book, but these two paragraphs on page, um, let's see, the almost certain consequences, where am I? I think it's page 24. Yes, the middle of page 24. The almost certain consequences that follow taking even a glass of beer do not crowd into the mind to deter us. If these thoughts occur, they are hazy and readily supplanted with the old, threadbare idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. There is a complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove. The alcoholic may say to himself in the most casual way, it won't burn me this time, so here's how. Or perhaps he doesn't think at all. How often have some of us begun to drink in this nonchalant way and after the third or fourth pounded on the bar and said to ourselves, for God's sake, how did I ever get started again? Only to have that thought supplanted by, well, I'll stop with the sixth drink or what's the use anyway? Uh, yeah, I don't know how many of you guys can relate to that, but definitely uh, I can. So before we get there, though, on page 23, um, Bill writes about the alcoholic not understanding why he or she drinks, which goes back to that section that Kate covered on 22, um, you know, why does he or she behave like this? Um, on page 23, he says, in their hearts, they really, 
but I write in their hearts, they really do not know why they do it. And that was definitely true for me. I, uh, I won't get into the details, but I did lots of things uh, that had really bad consequences and I could never understand why I continued to drink. So getting back to the solution, what, what is the solution if we are without defense? Um, and the short answer is it's a spiritual experience, which I think the first asterisk is on page 25. So I've jumped ahead again. I apologize for jumping around in this section. Uh, page 25, middle of the page, the great fact is just this and nothing less that we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences, which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, to our fellow, toward our fellows and toward God's universe. Since we jump to uh, the spiritual experience on page 567. Um, I'm only going to cover the first bit of this because uh, in this chapter, we go to the spiritual experience a few times. So Kate um, will also touch on it. But essentially, the opening uh, covers the fact that each individual is going to have his or her own personal spiritual experience. It doesn't need to be anything. Uh, it doesn't need to be fast or slow. And I had all, you know, I had all these expectations about what a spiritual experience should be. Um, and setting that aside and letting my higher power do the heavy lifting was really what got me uh, able to accept a spiritual experience. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to take action. And the other thing I'll say about a spiritual experience is for me personally, it required work. A huge reason that I couldn't stay sober for those first five years in the program was that I was expecting a spiritual solution to just happen. To me, uh, I'd read this and think, oh, you know, this, <laughs> I'm ready for it. You know, why isn't it happening? But if we go back to the top of page 25, uh, it says, almost none of us liked the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires, excuse me, for its successful consummation, but we saw that it really worked in others. And uh, I used to read the first part of that and just leave it at the first statement, you know, like, oh yeah, I don't like that stuff. Thanks for the acknowledgement. Um, but the paragraph continues to point out that there's nothing left for us to do, but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. You know, that's, there's nothing left. You know, we have to take action if we want this. It's our last resort. Um, but in my life, my higher power has done incredible things that I could never have done on my own. Um, which brings me back to that second full paragraph on 25. And one of the most important lines in the big book for me, which is, uh, he has commenced to accomplish those things for us, which we can never do by ourselves. And with that, I will pass it back to Kate. Thank you, Callie. Yeah, that's, um, it's, it's so powerful. We don't like that self-searching, leveling of our pride and confession, <clears throat> but it works. Yeah, thank you. Um, so on page 25, if you are as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle of the road solution. Well, darn it, you know, I want to moderate. Well, darn it, I want self-control. Well, guess what? This tells us in this paragraph that we have two choices, basically. We can blot out our consciousness. I'll just say that. We can blot out life. We can just blot out life. Or we can accept spiritual help, <laughs> right? There's two things. We can um, admit our powerlessness and we can surrender is one of our our member said earlier today that surrender, that deeper surrender and that deeper surrender. But there are conditions. There are conditions in this too. We're told it's the paragraph continues on to page 26. Um, we can um, get this kind of spiritual help if we do two things. We, um, we honestly want the spiritual help. Honestly want the spiritual help. So there's the trick word is honestly. And two, willing to make the effort. So those are the conditions under which we can get and accept spiritual help. Um, so if I'm basically what I'm reading there is if I don't want to have an impossible, humiliating, bitter, intolerant life, I get to um, seek out and accept spiritual help. And in order to do that, I have to honestly want it. 
and everyone gets to define their own version of how much they honestly want it. And then the willingness, um, the willingness for it. So those are the conditions, really wanting it and being willing, which doesn't seem to, <laughs> you know, it's like this easy is simple, but not easy, right? Like it's, sim it's simple. The, these conditions are very simple. You have to honestly want it and you um, have to be willing. That's, that's pretty simple, but the trick comes in um, trying to ace this test of willingness, open-mindedness and honesty. Um, so we get to a little story here about a businessman and I'm not going to read the story to you. You can enjoy it on your own. But as I read through it again, starting on um, page uh, 26, um, here's what I've been shown to understand through this story. And here's how I wanted to share it with you today. Um, basically, this story, we learn that self-knowledge will avail us nothing. We learn that this person in the story was seeking to know why. Um, but really the truth is, is that we're powerless and we cannot have self-control and self-will. This business person through this isn't necessarily seeking serenity or so sobriety, but he's seeking power and control over the disease. Um, and we don't have power over ourselves is something that we learn. And we can't give something to ourselves that we don't have. So he's never going to, in this story, have power over this solution um, to his problem, even though obviously we can see that he's going and probably spending lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, and lots of money and time trying to figure out and control the solution. Um, and so we're powerless. And I get this. I really, you know, when I first came into the program, um, I sought out outside help with therapy, self-help help books, quick fix solutions. Um, I too desperately wanted to know why I was so effed up. Um, but until I accepted my problem and honestly wanted a solution, honestly wanted a solution, not like dabbling in a solution. Um, I couldn't accept that spiritual solution. No one could force it upon me. I had to be ready for it. And then I get to learn from my sisters in this program and millions of other women who have this same problem and this same question too. Um, and so my sponsor told me, stop worrying about why you're different, <laughs> except that you're in the sisterhood and um, let's get into this spiritual solution together. And if I honestly want that, I can have that too. On page 27, um, we're told that there are some exceptions to the gates of hell, thank goodness, <laughs> and that it comes within the nature of a huge emotional displacement and rearrangement, also known as a psychic change in ourselves. So the solution is a psychic change and it's a vital spiritual experience. So I looked up the word vital, and it means absolutely necessary or important. Um, it means essential. And the other um, word for vital, or the description for vital, could be, can be full of energy and lively, which I really liked as well. Um, and it comes from vita in Latin, which means life. And so vital can also mean the source of life. So this is all telling me that um, this solution is bigger than me. It's vital. It's full of energy. It's got power in it that I don't have because I'm powerless. Um, and it is absolutely necessary in my life to have this. And in order to have this spiritual experience and rearrangement and emotional displacement, um, I need to have an open mind. And this is kind of for me where I, I learn about step two, coming to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. And we're directed back to 567 to the spiritual appendix here um, on page 27 um, toward the bottom. And, uh, you know, what we really see there is that we need, um, in order to have it, 
we need willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness. So if you re- as you read through that, we're told how we can get this spiritual experience. And I want to just make a little metaphor for you um, today, it being the new year. Um, for many years, I've been wanting to lose weight. Like basically all my life, I've been wanting to lose weight. Like how stupid is that, right? Okay, but anyway, there it is, right? I've been wanting to lose weight. And I want it off now. And you see those infomercials and you see the Facebook posts and you see the ads for quick, lose 20 pounds, right? Well, guess what? Um, Just because I want it doesn't make it so. So I might want a spiritual experience. I might want to lose weight, but that doesn't make it so. Um, I have to put in the work that my doctor tells me to put in, which is eating well, (laughs) the exercising and sleeping, right? If I do those things um, under those conditions, um, I might actually lose weight. Um, Kind of like how my sponsor tells me I need to be open-minded, willing, and honest. Um, Okay. And if I do those things, um, I'll get there. It may not be overnight. It may not be in 30 days money back guarantee, (laughs) right? Um, You know, but the shortcuts I've tried to take in the past for my weight loss haven't really helped me. They've gotten me back into the same problem again. You know, taking um, protein shakes and fasting and doing all this stupid crap, right? But it's really in doing the daily work that I'm directed by my doctor and by my spiritual sponsor that I can have a spiritual experience and I can get well, um, in my physical health and then with my sponsor and in the sisterhood in my spiritual health. And so, so I'm told, you know, I'm, I, I get to hang in here and um, I can take some measurements along the way, like I can in my weight loss, you know, you might measure your bicep. Oh yeah, baby. Um, But (laughs) I'm also going to measure my progress by taking the steps in this program. Right. And it's by taking these vital steps with my sponsor and working within the sisterhood that I can measure my spiritual experience. And it may not come in 30 days with the money back guarantee, but if I keep doing this and I'm open-minded and willing, it'll come. And um, so I'm going to pass to Callie in just a second here, but the story of this businessman, um, you know, finishing up on page top of page 28. um, We learned that this man is at the turning point in his dilemma. He can either accept his powerlessness and surrender or live his life under the lock and key of a bodyguard. I mean, right? Like surrender or be trapped. Like which, which one do you want? So basically this only solution for him in this story was to let go of needing to control the why and accept, be in acceptance. And I'll pass to Callie. Thanks, Kate. I know we've gone um, over time. I'll speed through these last couple pages here. Um, on page 28 at the top, it says, We in turn, we in our turn, sought the same as gave with all the desperation of drowning men. What seemed at first a flimsy read has proved to be the loving and powerful hand of God. A new life has been given us, or if you prefer, a design for living, which really works. And a few years ago, I realized uh, this is really neat. The way that this de- design for living works is the exact opposite of how drugs and alcohol used to work for me. Um, Drugs and alcohol were at first a powerful and reliable escape. And then over time, they turned into a flimsy read. Um, And then this program was at first a flimsy read. And over time, it's turned into a powerful, reliable design for living. And I just love this illustration. When I was a kid uh, in California, I once got caught in a rip current, and at the time in my life, at that time in my life, now even when I think about it, it was one of the scariest experiences I've ever had. I thought I'm going to get sucked out and die, um, and I picture that experience when I read this. You know, I was just digging into the sand and uh, getting, you know, pulled further and further out, and a flimsy read would not have helped me at that point. What I needed was someone who knew what they were doing. Um, in that case, a lifeguard, and in this case, in my life, I need a higher power, someone. Um, the next paragraph, which talks about varieties of spiritual experience, talks again about willingness and honesty, which I love, Kate, that you covered that so thoroughly, um, brought me back again to that line at the top of 26, which is this we did because we honestly wanted to and were willing to make the effort. And for me, willingness has to extend again um, to being willing to accept other people's design for living, you know, to accept another person's design for living. 
just because something has worked for me doesn't mean it's going to work for someone else. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't matter whether that person is in the program or is an active alcoholic or is, you know, normal. I don't get to pretend to practice willingness and then condemn other people's choices. So I'm um, just going to run through some of the points that we covered and then open up the floor. So to sum up, the why doesn't matter, even though it's a huge emphasis. <laughs> Uh, what we have in common is the solution. Elimination of our drinking is only beginning. A huge part of the solution, sometimes arguably the entire solution, is in helping others. In order to recover, do what others who have recovered have done and continue to do. Uh, our defense and solution takes the form of a spiritual experience or personality change, which comes from working the steps and working with others. Each individual will have his or her own personal experience. We have no idea how it will look. Uh, if we are willing and honest, our higher power will do things for us, which we could never do by ourselves. Self-knowledge avails us nothing. And to sum all of this up, this is not a way to stop drinking. It's a design for living. And it's really worked for me for over seven years. So um, that's, that's what I can share on that. And then also, um, today's reading and daily reflections is amazing. It really pertains to all of this. So if you want a picture of it, if you don't have the book, just text me and I'll be happy to send you a little screenshot of that. Thank you so much for letting us be of service. And I look forward to hearing what you all have to say. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.